start adding up the balance sheet of what we in the Army Service Forces have accomplished since December 7, 1941. This was the moment of resolution. This was the signal for unity to the 135 millionth power. We had been working before, working against opposition to prepare the country and its army. But now this meant the green light for the Army Supply Services. The green light that meant also the gravest of responsibilities, the most difficult of jobs. And on December 7 began a record of achievement of which we can all well be proud. A hundred thousand volunteers, a million and then another million enlisted men. Send them to us, we'll build the camps and we'll staff them and make them machines for living. We're ready for them. This is what we've been planning for. And now we're ready to move. We won't be caught unprepared. We had to learn how to take care of them, nurse them, insure them against the tropical and polar diseases they'll have to face. We had to work out systems of figuring what was their best job. And always we had to feed them, fill their bellies with good food, too. And we faced the monumental job of getting them the tools for their fighting. Designing those tools, testing them, making those tools, mass making them, financing their manufacture and buying them. And finally, making sure they get to the men who need them, whether for training or for fighting. And we got the job done faster than possible because our need was the most urgent the world has ever known. We had to get the tools to where they would do the most good. That too was our job and a big one. Lend lease in the billions of dollars worth. Little things like quinine, big things like trucks, or still bigger like 50 ton tanks. Allies desperately pressed, holding valiantly, holding time still for us. And the ASF must get to them, as well as to our own men, the tools they need. The men of the ASF, they never learned how important was this part of their job. It's too bad, but we were too busy to tell them. And still, the most important job we had was training our own men. The time that the Chinese and the Russians and the British saved for us saved the lives of these boys because we were doing our part by getting them the tools they needed to learn their job and by teaching them how to use these tools. We reached out over the seas and through the air to bring the vital supplies to a dozen new strange theaters of operation. And where there was no existing way to move in our supplies, where there was no line of communications, we sent in our engineers, and they made our line for us where none had existed before. And the goods got where they were needed, landed in half a hundred strange places. We were learning geography the hard way. Guadalcanal, Atu, Accra, Casablanca, Chungking, Kiska, Cairo, Algiers, Sicily. Within a few scant months of December 7, our ASF had ferried our American soldiers to Ireland and Alaska, to Trinidad and South America, to Egypt, China and India. But our ASF enlisted men never got a picture of what we were accomplishing. We were too busy accomplishing it to tell them. And so within a few scant months of December 7, we were on the attack on Guadalcanal. Within 11 months, hundreds of thousands of American troops had landed on the shores of North Africa and were beginning to use millions of tons of shipping. Before the end of the African campaign, these men were to use more equipment and supplies than we sent to France in the whole of World War I. The ASF had been given a responsibility. It was discharging that responsibility with honor and dispatch. The job we have done and will continue to do is justifiably a matter of pride for us. But it must also be a matter of pride for the enlisted men in our command. And this is not the case. For while the job of things was getting done, the job with people was being neglected. At home and abroad, the rank and file private, who is the army, flops himself down on the ground and beefs. <laughs> <laughs> 
And do you know what he beefs about? What he thinks of his job, his officers, his army, and his cause? Here's a very quick look into the mind of the average private. Only 48% of the men in the Army Service Forces know they are in the Army Service Forces. Check 100 soldiers in your command. An average of 52 of them will be unaware that they are identified with the ASF. Pride in one's own arm or branch is an essential part of pride in the service as a whole. Yet research shows that this principle is scarcely a factor in the upbuilding of esprit in the ASF. Less than two out of every ten soldiers' questions say they think most highly of their branch. Within the ASF, there are marked variations in the way the men in the various branches feel about their work. We have found that the Signal Corps and engineers have the greatest pride in service. But even there, three out of four men think more highly of some other branch than they do of their own. In the medical department, only 18% rate their service above any other. 16% in ordnance, 14% in the Quartermaster Corps, 12% in the military police, down to 7% in the chemical warfare service. From these figures, we can conclude that the great majority of our soldiers have no conviction that they have a vital share in the tremendous job we are doing. In fact, most of them feel they shouldn't be in the Army at all. Although they want to win the war, they believe they could do more important work as civilian war workers. And this is the percentage when they have been three months in the Army. It gets worse progressively. By the end of a full year, only 35% feel that their personal work as soldiers is the most valuable contribution they could be making to their country and to victory. Who is surprised in the light of these figures to learn that our men are not developing an esprit as their military experience lengthens? At the end of three months of training, only 54% of our ASF troops are proud of their outfit. By the end of the year, the figure has dropped to 30%. We asked them what they thought about the Nazis. Only 38% believe that the Nazis are a tough enemy and that our losses are likely to be high. 43% didn't think our losses would be very great, and another 18% thought our victory would be downright easy. As for their understanding of why we fight, they themselves say, officers and men alike, that their understanding is not thorough enough by half. Only some 58% of the men felt that their comrades know why they are fighting and their officers agree with their judgment. We ask them about ourselves and our allies. Who, we ask, do you think is trying hardest to win the war? Look well at Britain, grudgingly given 5% on effort. And 8% of the men said they didn't know. Considering this lack of basic conviction, it isn't remarkable that three soldiers in every ten tell us that they would prefer non-combat duty here at home, while only five out of ten want to get overseas and fight. Research shows also that there are ways to correct this kind of thinking and this lack of information. Consider the effect of the Army-produced films in the Why We Fight series. We found that while only 33 men out of 100 who had not seen these films answered a given set of questions correctly, 52 men in 100 knew the right answers after seeing the films. An American private went through the fighting in North Africa, and he sat down after it was over and wrote down what he thought was lacking in the training he'd gotten. American soldiers have no conception of the psychology of the enemy, he wrote. They're innocent and trusting, good-hearted and confiding. He might have added that they're brought up in the ways of sportsmanship, of not hitting below the belt. He might have added that the American soldier doesn't know what a fascist is, how a fascist thinks, what a fascist will do. He might have added that the American soldier is inclined to think stories about fascism or just the old atrocity stories, until it's too late. This American private wrote of his comrades, they do not really want to kill because they do not hate yet. He wrote, subconsciously they think of war as a game where the umpire's whistle will stop it before it gets too rough. They cannot imagine anybody wanting to kill them, so they commit all the mistakes which have cost so many lives already. This American private wrote of his comrades who died at Kasserine Pass, 
They died with an astonished look on their faces as if they wanted to ask, could that be possible? Would they really kill me? And so our soldiers are growing to realize more and more that they've not gotten the kind of psychological training they should have gotten. And naturally, our war correspondents have noticed it. And because of their stories here at home, millions of families are learning about it and asking questions. Ernie Pyle wrote thoughtful, provocative dispatches about the American soldier's lack of psychological training. Drew Middleton in the New York Times commented, We can translate this. It means, most American soldiers are not prepared to fight fascism because they don't understand what a mortal, inhuman, deadly, vicious evil it is. They don't know that fascism is murder. Too often their own murder is the only way they learn. Some of the guilt will lie with us if we do not take the necessary steps to tell them about this beast they're fighting, to warn them of its nature, to train them psychologically to hate Nazis so that they will be able to kick the hell out of them. raised by the Allied invasion of Europe, the march of time has brought together three leading military analysts, Anson Baldwin, DeWitt McKenzie, and Paul Schubert. I'm going to put the first question to Mr. Baldwin. Mr. Baldwin, what is the importance of bombing and the Allied invasion strategy? Bombing, round-the-clock bombing by day and by night, will be a major factor in the decline and fall of Adolf Hitler. The air invasion of Europe already has started, but the real bombardment of Germany is just beginning. Air bombing alone will never win this war, but air bombardment may represent the final crowning blow which will bring down the whole crazy structure of Nazism to disaster. But we cannot safely count upon this. We must plan for a land invasion of the fortress of Europe. Mr. Schubert, can we consider the invasion of Italy as a logical first step toward the invasion of Germany? If the real goal of an invading army is the penetration of German soil, there are several routes that seem much more promising than the pathway through Italy, which is shut off from the rest of Europe by the barrier of the Alps. The way through France is shorter, though stiffly defended. The way through the Balkans goes a long way around, but may be easier when it comes to the fighting part. Mr. McKenzie, which of the possible invasion routes appeals to you as leading us most quickly into the inner fortress of Hitler's Europe? The best invasion route is undoubtedly the route which can be most easily supplied. This means an attack on the Atlantic coast of Europe at a point close to a good port and not too far from England, which remains our best supply base in European waters. Such an operation, of course, would not preclude other assaults in the Mediterranean theater. Uh, Mr. Baldwin, Mr. McKenzie has mentioned the problem of supply. Do you feel that the supply problem, I think you call it logistics, is the controlling factor in the whole Allied strategy of invasion? There is no doubt about it. In the air, on the land, and on the sea, this is a quartermaster's war. The problem of victory is the problem of supply. Solve it, and the battle's won. Since Pearl Harbor, America has been amassing for the invasion of Axis Europe, the greatest stockpile of weapons and materials of war ever created in the nation's history. In its pledge to provide American fighting men for a dozen fronts, present and future, in Europe and in Asia, first thought has been that no battle must be lost, no soldier's life wasted for lack of arms or equipment. At innumerable strategic points in the Western Hemisphere and in distant lands, 
secret depots are stocked with all the goods an army needs. And today, stand ready for the troops who will make use of them. Within the Festung Europa, the fortress created for the Axis warlords' last stand against the wrath of the United Nations, the fascist and Nazi underlings and quislings already know that the hour of retribution can no longer be indefinitely delayed. For since many months, the war of nerves which they invented and exploited has been turned against them and to good effect. But the master plan by which the Axis power finally will be shattered and the subjugated nations of Europe and Asia return to freedom is still the closely guarded secret of a tiny group of military leaders, members of the war councils of the United Nations. Housed in Washington's newest and biggest architectural behemoth, the Pentagon Building, is the headquarters of the Army Service Forces and its taught and forceful commander, Lieutenant General Brehan Somerville. Among his staff are seven trusted major generals who head the technical services of the ASF, each a key man in America's plan for victory. Oldest technical body in the Army Service Forces is the Quartermaster Corps, traditionally the Army's tailors and caterers. 70,000 different items of food, clothing, and equipment, other than arms, must be regularly supplied by these men for the millions of American troops at home or on the invasion front, as well as many objects destined for lend-lease aid to America's allies. Every day at home or abroad, from quartermaster depots, are coming in a continuous flow all the innumerable workaday necessities without which an army cannot live and cannot fight. The Corps of Engineers numbers in its elite the intelligentsia of the Army. Its role as troubleshooter and trailblazer for American forces overseas has made its part in the invasion of the Axis Fortress a basic one. Army engineers must be ready to demolish or construct in every corner of the world at war. The Army Map Service, operated by the Corps of Engineers, has issued to every American expeditionary force accurate topographic information, checked and brought constantly up to date by expert cartographers and a staff of aerial photo analysts. High-speed offset presses have already supplied close to a thousand tons of detailed maps to American forces overseas. Each map a tile in the mosaic of invasion. Upon no department of the Army Service Forces have invasion requirements made greater demands than upon the Ordnance Department. Charged with designing and procuring all weapons and vehicles with which the Army fights and travels, but in a year and a half of war, American arms production has caught up with and surpassed the combined output of the Axis nations. Today, the Signal Corps of the ASF stands ready to set up and maintain the network of communications on which all future combined sea, air, and land operations depend for success. The Chemical Warfare Service knowing well the lengths to which desperation may drive a cornered enemy, is ready to make reprisals in kind should the Axis resort to the use of poison gas. In training, following doctrines laid down by the Chemical Warfare Service, soldiers have been conditioned to gas attacks, become adept in the use of chemical smoke screens. The medical department of the ASF confronted with problems of medicine, surgery, and hygiene on every continent, has its plans well evolved to combat injury and disease on any and every front. And due to their diligence and research, thousands of lives will have been saved, many an epidemic averted in occupied territory. 
The transit of tens of millions of tons of supplies and millions of fighting men is the function of the Army Service Forces Transportation Corps, whose men have learned in camp to act as stevedores in distant bridgehead ports and as railroad men in war areas to ensure the delivery of supplies without loss of time to the fighting front. The ASF, charged with coordinating its training with that of the Army as a whole, has brought home the reality of modern battle to millions of U.S. soldiers. In hardening drills during final training, live ammunition is used to teach the trainee to take no needless chances and to move in action like a seasoned veteran. In specialized schools, officers of the Army Service Forces study combat tactics as well as the responsibilities of their own corps. Coordination of service and ground forces is an essential part of their indoctrination. The School of Military Government of the Army Service Forces has long studied the problem of administering occupied territory in such a way as to provide maximum protection for United Nations interests. Our civil affairs job is not to govern the German people. Our job is to take control of the city government so as to keep the peace behind the fighting lines so that our troops will not have to be looking over their shoulders all the time. The point is to find a spot in the city government. What if the Burgermaster won't cooperate? We'll make him play ball or we'll set up another one in his place. Our best bet is to govern Germany through their own officials, supplanting the extreme Nazis with those who will act intelligently and well. Anticipating the financial chaos of reconquered Europe, the ASF has provided millions of invasion dollars to serve as a temporary currency until local finances can be stabilized. Staff officers of the Army Service Forces have long ago become familiar with the terrain of every invasion coastline, have studied in minute detail the landing beaches and ports of the enemy. When a long planned movement of invasion begins, the signal for the execution of the entire complex program passes down the network of ASF command. From those who have long known the whole strategy to those whose duty it is to perform the operations of detail. In each of the ten areas of the U.S. controlled by an ASF service command, things begin to happen, of which the impact will be felt only later, thousands of miles away. In Omaha and Dallas, from the Great Lakes to the Gulf, a mighty army is on the move, quietly and secretly sending its weapons, stores, and men toward its appointed rendezvous, the port of embarkation. <laughs> to transport by rail a single armored division, 75 trains are needed, and all must move simultaneously, load and unload within a space of hours. A typical invasion force capable of succeeding in a major mission would require many full divisions, including specialized troops of every type, from paratroops as the spearhead of airborne attack to regiments of wax assigned to non-combatant duty at invasion outposts, some of them not far from the fighting lines. When an invasion force sets out, there may be music. But the Army's need for secrecy has eliminated the cheering crowds and public farewells of World War I.
the Army has been able to protect the secrecy of all major troop movements with the voluntary cooperation of the American public, nothing can inhibit the citizens' right of reasonable surmise and logical conjecture. Well, I wouldn't want you to repeat this, but my sister's boy left for overseas last week, and I happen to know he's going straight to Norway. Norway? Why, I've heard it was Bulgaria. <laughs> U.S. invasion forces are moving toward their distant goal, many an American can still refuse to believe what he sees in the papers. Take it from me. We can't do a thing over there until a year from now at the very least. At the port of embarkation, work has proceeded for many days, quietly and efficiently. Since for every soldier landed overseas, an initial 15 tons of supplies and equipment must be provided. At an average of two tons a month, shipped to maintain him in the field. When an invasion ship is loaded, each object must be in its appointed place, so that when the crucial moment of unloading comes, perhaps under enemy bombardment, those weapons and supplies which are needed first will be the first at hand. Of the 900,000 categories of supplies the Army service forces must procure and distribute, a high percentage is required for the Army's work of invasion and occupation and must accompany the expeditionary force on the day it puts to sea. tip from, it's hot. In Washington, they're laying four to one that the big invasion will get underway by Friday. On sailing day, nothing can have been overlooked. No detail unforeseen. And above all, the plan of attack and the plan of supply must have been meticulously coordinated and timed to the fraction of an hour, even though the objective be an invasion point still thousands of miles away. When an invasion convoy clears the port of embarkation, the ASF has accomplished only the first part of its appointed task. It has mobilized from far and wide those men and resources which can solve the problem of logistics and give an army the power to invade and to invade victoriously. But as long as an American soldier still is under arms at home or on a foreign shore, so long will America's army be dependent on the smooth and unceasing functioning of the army service forces, on the foresight, skill, and patience of those men who have welded it into the military link between American efficiency in production, management, and invention, and the needs of America's fighting men. Time marches on. If your men see a film like this march of time, it will help to give them pride in their outfit. But you still have the considerable job of giving them pride in themselves by giving them satisfaction in their work. It can be safely stated that most of the individual problems result from incorrect job classifications. Bad classification still exists. A review of all your officer classifications 
personal inspection and inquiry throughout all echelons will do much to correct it. This must be a creative job, a job for your initiative and originality. One idea, which is mentioned here only to start you thinking about your specific problems, was devised by an Army Air Force's general. Whether the idea is practical or not, it has at least the virtue that it sets out to solve an admittedly serious problem. He supplied all the men in his command with a postcard on which the enlisted man or officer may indicate that he believes he is a square peg in a round hole and may also suggest how he thinks he can better serve the army. But it should be stressed that this is a suggestion on procedure, not an order, that you must be creative in applying such suggestions to the problems of your own command. Training and arming men mentally is more important than training and arming them physically. And it's not a question simply of getting the right orientation material. It's a question of making sure that material is used. Far too often we have found the materials are being produced only to be ignored. For example, here's a news map. It catches the soldier's eye. He wants information about the war. But the obsolete side of this news map has been used as a poster outside an orderly room for nearly a year. It's not difficult to get these weekly news maps. Army service forces turn out 70,000 of them every week and are prepared to send them wherever they're requested. Each Monday they should be posted where every man can see them, where they can become the basis together with the daily news summaries for an informal discussion by a competent company commander. Pride in outfit, pride in self, these are important of course, but still the job will not be done until we have given every soldier a solid knowledge of why he is fighting in this war. The news map, all the discussions around the news summaries, the War Department film bulletins, these things will help. One of the ways to give the men a picture of the nature of the enemy, a picture of our allies and their contributions, comes from the series of films called Why We Fight. Here in these films is a picture of the background of the war which must be given the recruit at his reception center and at his replacement training center. By directive from the War Department, commanding officers have been told their men must see these films. Commanding officers themselves should make sure that the films are properly introduced and explained by an officer. These pictures were taken from the first four in the series, Why We Fight. We're showing them to remind you how well they exemplify the kind of orientation which we know is so badly needed. And we know that only 50% of our soldiers have seen these films. 100% of our men must know the enemy, must see his works, must see with their own eyes what Nazism has done in Poland, what it has done to women and children, to harmless civilians who maybe for a brief while, years ago, thought there would be peace in our time. The civilians of Czechoslovakia, of Norway, these women and children may well be relatives of the men in our American army. They could be our own mothers and sisters and children. The men of our army must see these acts of frightfulness. Here is one way to show him that atrocity stories are not just propaganda. These are more than just good moving pictures of a series of planned and terrible crimes against people. They are an instrument to use in teaching our soldiers what they are coming up against. An instrument to use in teaching our soldiers the kind of misery and death that our enemies would visit on us. An instrument to use to teach our soldiers so that they may fight better so that they may not be slaughtered like defenseless children as they were in Kasserine Pass. An instrument to use in teaching our soldiers hatred, not a purposeless hatred, but the kind of hatred which will stand them in good stead when they move up to kill or be killed. Will men who have seen sights like these still think of fascism as some funny kind of politics used by Germans and Italians? These films are by no means going to do our whole job for us, but they can accomplish important good for all our troops. They must be shown, and they must be shown to every last enlisted man. As for our allies, the British and Russians and the Chinese, they know from first-hand experience what fascism means. Ask the French after more than three years of slavery and starvation, they know. But 
our men have not had this first-hand experience. Their first-hand experience with a sky black with bombers will be actual combat experience. It must be our job to insure them against too great a shock. These pictures will help to accomplish that insurance. Show our men these films of the Battle of Britain, and something more than 5% of them will say that the British are really trying to win the war. Show them these films of the young British flyers roaring up to do battle with a Luftwaffe that outnumbered them 10 to 1. And they won't jeer at the British as they have in the past and as they are doing at present. Show them these films of Coventry. Show them the devastation and the flame and the crime, the mortal evil which is fascism and Nazism. Show them why the British are fighting, and they will understand why we fight too. Our soldiers haven't had to bury their wives, their children, their families. They still don't know. But they can be told. And the best job will still be done by the officer who realizes that he must supply creative leadership. That down through every echelon of command to the men, whether they are preparing themselves for active combat or are assigned to an unglamorous job at a supply depot, the officer must communicate to them pride in outfit, pride in self, and a burning conviction in the right of our cause. When this job of creative leadership has been accomplished, and only then, we will be able to take a breath and say, these soldiers are the best damn soldiers on earth. They're ready to do battle or service the frontline fighters. They'll win and in winning, they're learning how to lay the foundations for a secure world, a free world, a world of peace.